Stories of the Nazgul, number five, Balaknar Sunfire. In the past, in lands far to the south, where the stars are different and the sun scorches the earth, where few from Middle-earth have ever ventured, a number of petty kingdoms rose and fell. Among the many, one rose above all others, one who set out to unite the tribes and claim all the lands of Farhad, daring even to claim the title of King of Men. This one was Balaknar Sunfire. On the night of his birth, a great comet flashed across the heavens, illuminating the lands as though it were day. The seers, ever watchful of signs, prophesied that the comet's strength had been given to the boy, and he would lead the men of Farhad to conquest and glory as had never been seen. They said that he, above all others, would live forever. A fighter from his early youth, the boy formed a brotherhood of like-minded friends and warriors, earning their respect and love. This fraternity would later become his inner council, and each man would swear fealty to Balaknar in their youth. Balaknar's father, Balaktur, had his own dreams of uniting the tribes of Farhad, however, and he resolved in secret that the comet had been an omen for his destiny and not his son's. And when Balaknar turned 16, his father had already conquered more land and more tribes than any leader had before him. He was hailed as the mightiest of the mighty, chief of chiefs, and Balaknar was oft forgotten in his father's long shadow. However, the seer's message was clear. It would be Balaknar and not Balaktur that would live forever. In turning his army to the north for the first time, this proved true, as Balaktur came upon the forces of the deserts of Farharad. Thinking these nomadic peoples weak, he led his armies openly onto the sands, parading the heads of conquered tribesmen before him. He was given no warning of the poisoned arrow that found his neck shortly after he climbed on the first of the great sand dunes, and his lifeless body fell and was consumed by the army rising from the sands. Panic gripped Balakter's forces, but without hesitation, Balaknar and his loyal fraternity began giving sharp orders and organised an effective retreat. And within days, despite his young age, Balaknar took his father's place and cemented his hold on the tribes. Many knew of the seer's prophecy, and many had doubted Balakter's claims that he was the Blessed One. They sided with Balaknar swiftly. Many more battles were fought under sun and moon, on the savannas, in the jungles, and on the shifting sands. And with each battle, Balaknar and his captains proved their skill, and more and more tribes were brought into the fold. In one battle, with the last of the desert tribes, Balaknar earned his title of Sunfire. The battle had not gone as easily as the many before. These tribesmen were deft hands with the bow, and their mastery of the sands was simply unmatched. As the line of his army began to waver and break, Balaknar mounted his horse, and escorted only by his honour guard, he burst through the lines of melee, and, against all odds, he made it to the gathered enemy bowmen. As he charged, the sun rose high, its rays catching on his shining armour and outstretched scimitar. It is said that the sunlight blinded his enemies, and it seemed to all who looked on that Balaknar was enveloped in flame. With an almighty roar, he fell upon his foes, as a flame dancing within the fire. Bolstered by this courageous act, and guided by the flaming beacon that was their chieftain, his army turned the tide. And thereafter, rumour spread that the comet itself was born in Balaknar, and some tribes swore fealty before battle was even joined. Soon, it was done. The empire of Farharad had risen, and at its head stood Balaknar Sunfire, true chief of chiefs, king of kings, emperor supreme, and the king of all men. With victory achieved, Balaknar turned to ruling, and he proved an able king. Caravans, laden with wealth, began roaming further and further afield, safely and securely thanks to the empire of Farharad. The wealth amassed in the south at this time grew significant, and eventually these traders made their way to the banks of the southern Anduin itself. On their return, they spoke of marvels and wonders of the north, of fertile lands that prospered under different stars, and Balaknar saw opportunity. 
more lands to claim, more tribes to conquer. The merchants, however, were quick to warn Balaknar of a nameless shadow that tainted the north, but he paid little heed to this. Orders were given, and his armies mustered. During this time of preparation, a strange company of men came to Balaknar's camp. They were clad in dark metal armour, and all but one had obscured faces. Their leader was tall, taller than most men, and he walked with a serene grace as though the earth and all upon it was his. Stopped by the guards, he was asked what business he had with the Sunfire, and smiling warmly, he spoke with a pure and enchanting voice, and said he wanted to see the King of Kings himself and lend his support. Mesmerised, the guards permitted his entry, and he came before Balaknar and spoke of wonders in the north, and vast, bountiful lands. He knew much, and the Sunfire was in awe of this man's presence. Somehow, this stranger knew of growing dissent in the south of Balaknar's empire, of men who sought to claim power for themselves, and tribes who longed to return to their old ways. Mustering the strength to speak, Balaknar asked who this stranger was, and he replied, You, glorious king, may call me Anatar. In my language, it means Lord of Gifts, and it is a fitting gift, for I bring to you a ring bestowed with unimaginable power that will strengthen all that you are. Take it, mighty king, and lead your people to glory." Balaknar eyed the ring hesitantly, and a vision began to take shape in his mind. A man, resplendent in bright, shining, golden armour, was leading a mighty army. He could see the banners of this man covered all the lands from north to south, and it was him. Balaknar, Lord of all. At length he spoke. You are brave to come to me, armed as you are, and escorted by strange warriors, but I sense the goodwill of this gift-giving, and let it be known that the Sunfire does not turn aside generous offers and tokens of friendship. I will gladly take this ring. And with that, he slipped the ring onto his finger. Anatar gave a smooth smile and praised Balaknar's wisdom. He bid the king farewell, and as dusk fell, he vanished into the night. Balaknar began his northern campaign as sun rose, and with each passing day he felt stronger and stronger. Wherever he appeared on the field of battle in the coming days, his enemies simply crumbled. He fought furiously, his blade blazing like the fire of the sun both day and night. For many more years he fought and conquered. Yet as time passed, his behaviour changed. Subtly, at first, he became more savage, and where before he was merciful and gentle, now he was brutal and swift to kill, as death incarnate. His captains, and his oldest friends, noticed this change, and in secret they plotted. Balaknar's empire now stretched from the deep jungles of the far south to the grasslands of Harondor. A greater extent of conquest in the south had never been and nor ever would be again. It was during the height of his empire's extent that the first uprisings began. The men of the jungles declared themselves free, and Balaknar gave little care to this now. The empire meant nothing to him. There was only battle, only the thrill of the kill and the hunger for more bloodshed. He could find blood to shed everywhere. The south did not matter. His captains now openly questioned his rule. It was their homeland in turmoil, their families and their people. They wanted to put down the rebellion and then return home to live out their days in peace. They petitioned Balaknar, but he was deaf to their cries. Now fully ensnared by the ring, he sought only bloodshed. One night, his captains came to him and demanded that he return south. Balaknar saw nothing but mutiny and disloyalty, and exploded into a rage. He drew his sword and made for the nearest man. The gathered captains were ready for this reaction, but nothing could prepare them for the strength of Balaknar. Outwardly, he was now a short man, bent over despite his young age. His skin was pale and shallow, and he rasped for air with every spoken word. Yet the fire within him burned hotter than ever, and he easily overcame his strongest warriors. Terror then gripped his men, and it was all they could do to defend themselves. After a few moments of fighting, Balaknar found himself face to face with Surukji, 
his oldest friend and the de facto second in command of the Empire of Far Harad. The fear he saw in those eyes froze him in place. The anger and rage flooded from him and he sank to the floor and wept. He was left alone. He could not remember for how long he knelt on that dry floor. But three days passed, news came to Balaknar that each of his captains had left the army and their companies had gone with them. His force was now less than a third of what it was before. His campaign was brought to a halt, but his hunger for blood did not ease. And after some months had passed, with the madness taking a hold of him, he resolved that he would return home and put every disloyal commander to the sword. His army turned south, and on their march they burned every town and village to the ground, slaughtering any who stood in their way. Balaknar's benevolence had turned to hatred and disgust. In time, he made the long journey home, and found that rebellion had turned to secession. His captains had divided the south into numerous petty kingdoms, and declared themselves as the new kings. And these kings had spread word around the empire that Balaknar had gone mad and was murdering his own people. Thousands abandoned him, and when he finally reached the fringes of southern Haradwaith and looked out at the jungle stretching before him, Balaknar stood alone. The jungle came alive, and an army numbered in the hundreds of thousands took shape on the ground before him. It was over. Staring out at him from the boughs of the jungle's trees were his own men. And in that moment, he remembered the words Anatar had spoken to him a long time ago. Beware the fickle nature of men. Trust no one and hold only to yourself, Balaknar. The Sunfire finally understood the meaning of these words, and he gave out a terrible scream. Like no sound ever heard in the south, it was shrill and pierced to the very soul of each man. Balaknar turned his back on the south and wandered into the desert alone. For many weeks, he walked aimlessly. Visions came to him at night time of a ghostly world, devoid of life. And in time, something seemed to call to him, a voice from deep within his head, a voice he recognised but could not place. Return to me now, it said. He walked and walked, and eventually, now fully overcome with madness of these visions and voices, he came into a strange ashen land, and in the distance he could see a great mountain with flames issuing from its peak. Had he died? Stretching out before him was a great lake. The water seemed clear and cool despite the surroundings. He knelt and began to drink. The taste was foul despite the appearance, but his thirst seemed unquenchable and Balaknar felt a presence approach as he drank. He knew before turning who had come. All of a sudden, he knew more than he had ever known, as though a secret door had opened in his mind and untold knowledge was now his. He knew his destiny now. He would indeed live forever. And at length he spoke. Command me, my Lord Sauron. I am yours. The figure behind him smiled warmly. This story was written by Aitius, or Aitaeus, depending on how you pronounce the Latin name. It is not a canonical story, and was written for Divide and Conquer as a way of giving a little bit of history to the Nazgul. I hope you have enjoyed, and thank you.